Air of Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. World leaders, they must really think that God sleeps. You know, as it's in light of looking at the different passages, the prophecies that speak about the nations being gathered um, against Israel, coming up into Israel, different ones, all the way from Psalm 83, Micah, uh, all the different prophecies, Joel, etc., that speak of the nations coming against Israel, the world leaders. They are confederate, as Psalm 83 speaks about them. And yet, they, all the leaders seem to be oblivious as they have made their confederacy against the people of God, the land where His chosen people were promised to return. Well, we begin to take a look at some of the prophecies in light of some of the latest news that's going on in the Middle East. And... Uh, come up across some new things there that I think will be a blessing to you. So let's get right into it. And uh, of course, one of the first things I want to just kind of share with you here, the oldest man in the world, this was in Israel National News, uh, came out today, uh, says that the oldest man in the world is now an Israeli man. And his name is Yisrael Crystal at the age of 112 years old. There was another man just before him that was also 112 years old that just passed away. And, uh, but this man here now an Israeli who has survived two world wars as well as an Auschwitz survivor as well. Uh, so it's very, very nice to see that, uh, that he's lived so long and we just pray that God will bless him as well. Anyway, getting right into the message this evening, we look at uh, nations are gathered against you, uh, Micah 4.11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. Now, if you think about that, even in the, uh, the Hebraic term, as I looked at this uh, this evening before coming on here, the, the nations that are gathered against you, that gathering is actually like in a barn, so to speak. It's, it's, the root of this word really comes from like that. And it makes me think of the United Nations when I look at the Hebraic side of this terminology. And of course, in this particular photograph here is when Pope Francis was addressing the United Nations, and he has really led a charge against the Jewish people. Uh, he has sided with the Palestinians, a Palestinian state, clearly in violation of the prophecy of Joel, where Joel says uh, God would bring judgment upon those that are dividing his land. Um, and, and, you know, I know there's some people that really think that he's a good pope, and, uh, but, you know, when you go directly against God's promises uh, to Israel, then there's just, how can you make him a good pope, period? He falls right in line with all the rest of the popes. The only, problem, the only difference is, is he seems to be more, um, uh, he seems to be like a peacemaker, but he's not a peacemaker. Uh, it's very sad to see, but yes, this is where the, the beginning of this uh, takes place. This is where the nations gather against Israel. Now, I want to share with you the same verse from the Septuagint. Uh, and those of you that are not familiar with the Septuagint, the Septuagint is when the Hebraic scriptures were translated from Hebrew into the Greek language by 70 different uh, rabbis and scholars of that era back uh, to about two or three hundred years uh, before the coming of Yeshua, the Messiah. And, um, and of course, the, the Hebrew that we have today is not from that original Hebrew. The Hebrew we have today was translated about 300 years after Yeshua. So there's about a 500-year gap. Uh, and of course, the rabbis wanted to put the, the, the scriptures back in the Hebrew language because they felt like it was too Christianized, being that uh, the Septuagint was a Greek translation of the day. Now, and I appreciate that, and I do understand that. But when you begin to look at the Septuagint, uh, in some cases especially, I'm really interested in the way it's translated because it gives us a little bit different insight um, into what's being said. So as we uh, drop back just quickly, again, Micah 4, 11, and from the Masoretic, uh, that's what they call the Hebrew that we have today, the Masoretic text, it says, Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. But in the Septuagint it says, And now have many nations gathered against you, saying, We will rejoice, and our eyes shall look upon Zion. Now this is very interesting in light of prophecies that are laying in the Bible already about the rejoicing. 
When does the earth rejoice? The, for one, at the death of the two witnesses, as you see on the right side of your screen, the Revelation 11, 10, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So we know according to Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 14, this is where God prophesies of destroying uh, Edom or Esau, which is, uh, we don't have the time to go in this video here, but this is clearly identified as Rome. If you look at the book of Obadiah, where it speaks about Edom and how his secret things are sought out. Uh, and of course, uh, Edom or Esau is identified as uh, Titus, the Roman general who was there in the day of Israel when her when when Jerusalem was laid siege to and her and her treasures were carried away. Uh, and he says that you stood aloof as one with your brother, just paraphrasing from the book of, uh, uh, of um, uh, the book of Obadiah there. And uh, but it is, of course, the Titus, the Roman general that it's speaking of Daniel as well clearly identifies the Romans uh, once again as being the Antichrist spirit when he says that the prince that shall come would be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Again, letting you know that that Antichrist will come out of Rome. Now, some argue, well, it was actually the Syrians that did that. Obadiah does also clearly identify that there were others involved in the destruction of the city, but indicts the Romans for the guilty side of it and calls them Edom. And we know in the Ark of Titus, their memorial that they make for Titus for bringing back the treasures into, uh, into uh, modern day Italy today. And according to one uh, source, uh, one Jewish source that says that he was allowed to see it by the Catholic Church in the catacombs was allowed to see the menorah. Uh, that was an Italian, or excuse me, a man from, uh, from northern Africa, a Jewish man from there that was allowed to see that. Now, Ezekiel 35, 14 states, Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoiceth, I will make thee desolate. All right, this is when Rome is made desolate, is when the earth rejoices. Well, according to Revelation 11, 10, that takes place, the earth rejoices at the time of the death of the two witnesses. But what was ironic was when we looked at the Septuagint, according to Micah 4, 11, it's also the earth rejoices when the nations are gathered against, uh, against Israel there. They will be saying, we will rejoice and our eyes shall look upon Zion. Now, it does say we will rejoice, okay? It doesn't say they're rejoicing as of yet. The rejoicing comes at the death of the two witnesses. So what's kind of ironic is the nations are now gathered, all right? And that gathering is two different types of ways that can be. One, the gathering is, like I said, it's like kind of in a corral. So therefore, the United Nations that is a, against Israel is a gathering against the Jewish people. All right, that's one form of gathering. But then God also says he will bring them down to, uh, and he speaks in different places. One place is Jerusalem in the Bible. Another place is in Megiddo, in the Valley of Megiddo there, in the Jezreel Valley. So we have different, different prophecies that speaks about how this will happen. Uh, and at the same token there, while the nations are gathered, one, we see it in, in the United Nations, they're gathered against Israel. And then we also see it in militarily, many nations are gathered against Israel. And that's another thing that's interesting as well in the prophecy. It doesn't say that all the nations come down in the, in, in the case of Micah, but it says many nations are gathered against thee. All right, so they come down. They are against Israel. And it says that they, and according to the prophecy, it says that they will rejoice. All right, we will rejoice and our eyes shall look upon Zion. And of course, the rejoicing comes once they kill the two witnesses. Now, according to that young man, uh, brother, little brother Nathan, the Jewish boy that saw in his near-death experience, uh, I thought it was kind of interesting because he sees those nations come against Israel physically in the actual battle at the, when he says when he sees the two, the, the two dead men raise up on the Mount of Olives. And then, of course, he says, Messiah comes, and it's like time stands still. So, uh, yes, everything seems to be falling in line for these things exactly. Now, moving along, going back to Ezekiel, Ezekiel says why they rejoice. It's because of taking Israel after, they, after the two witnesses, uh, or excuse me, after they are two states 
this is another thing that I think is important to bring out is why Ezekiel brings this up. Let's look at verse 9 and 10. It says, I will make thee a perpetual desolations, and thy city shall not return, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Uh, Ezekiel 35 verse 10 says, Because thou hast said, These two nations, these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. All right. Now, they says, according this was the Masoretic says, was there. According to the Septuagint, it was translated, whereas the Lord is there. Now, that kind of is interesting as well. Again, looking back at little Nathan's uh, near-death experience there, he actually notes that the Mashiach uh, happens to come at the time that the nations are coming to attack Israel. Right, at the, right up to the death of the two witnesses. So, yes, the Lord is there in that regards there, according to the Septuagint. Uh, and, of course, it's also clearly identifying that there are two states at that time as well. So when the two witnesses are here, there will definitely be a definitive answer that they are two states. It will have definitely been done. And, of course, the main man behind it all is none other than uh, Pope Francis here, as everybody wants to call him Papa. Well, he's uh, not my Papa, that's for sure. He may be a Papa, all right, but we won't go into that issue at all. Anyway, so the Pope has united the world against the Jewish people. Uh, that's what happened in Psalm 83, verses 5 to 7. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. That's speaking about against Israel. The tabernacles of Edom... As we said in Obadiah, we saw that already. I've already shared that with you. Obadiah clearly identifies it. Also, does, so does Daniel identify them uh, as uh, the Romans as being Adam. It says, and the Ishmaelites, which are mostly, for the most part, that's your Sunni believers in the, in the, uh, the, the Sunni nations surrounding Israel, uh, of Moab, the Hagarenes, Gebal, Ammon, and Amalek, and the, uh, the Philistines were the inhabitants of Tyre. Now, I've actually done a video on this before. I have no idea what I called it there, but, uh, but I speak about this in depth. I talk about, you know, where it says they have consulted against thy hidden ones. The hidden ones are the two witnesses. Sephanecha, that's your, the word for uh, hidden in Hebrew. Uh, and I do believe that that refers to the hidden ones. Uh, Chuck Missler said to me one time privately, he asked me when we were walking in the hallway in his, uh, in his place there in Utah, and he said, Steve, do you think that that happens to deal with the raptured believers? And, and I, uh, at the time, I wasn't sure. So I wrote Chuck later, and I told him, I said, Chuck, I don't believe so. I believe it is the two, hidden, the, 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 the two witnesses, because why else would they... Why would they be taking a consultation against ones that are hidden if they're not coming back? And of course, those uh, believing uh, for the rapture, uh, they know they go away and don't come back. And uh, I, I have a, you know, well, we won't go into that issue there, but, uh, but I will say this, the two witnesses, they are hidden, but yes, they are definitely coming back. So anyway, they do have a confederacy, and that's exactly what the Pope of Rome has done. Here's an example here and Vatican to recognize a Palestinian state in the new treaty, New York Times, May 13th, 2015. We know it's already a done deal. It's already actually been signed, put into law, and everything in the, in the, in the Vatican has already done that as of January of this year, 2016. But the article here stated, uh, the Vatican, Jerusalem, the Vatican announced Wednesday that it would soon sign a treaty that includes recognition of the state of Palestine, lending significant symbolic weight to the intensifying Palestinian push for international support for sovereignty that bypasses uh, the paralyzed negotiation with Israel. It's done a lot more than that. In fact, the weight is so tremendous uh, behind uh, the Palestinian people now that when uh, Vice President Joe Biden came to Israel, he went to offer uh, Mahmoud Abbas of uh, the PA, Palestinian authorities, uh, he offered him a peace plan that would divide Jerusalem and allow him to have East Jerusalem as his capital, no less, and he flatly refused it. Let me tell you, let me read to you a little bit from, uh, from Israel National News on March 10th, just a uh, day or so ago. Uh, it says, according to the Palestinian Al-Quds newspaper, the U.S. vice president used the opportunity to present Abbas with a fresh initiative 
which would have included dividing Jerusalem and a total freeze on the Israeli settlement building in Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem. In return, the PA would be expected to recognize Israel as the Jewish state and give up its demand for a right of return for the descendants of the Arabs who left the country during the Israeli War of Independence in 1948. Abbas, not, Abbas, not for the first, promptly rejected the generous offer. Why? Pope's already given him the offer, and he took it. He took what the Pope gave him, and he knows he'll get whatever he wants, and that's why he's not holding out, you know? So the whole thing is the nations are against, though, Israel. And, it's, of course, it's not just the Catholic Church. We see it everywhere. Iran threatens Israel with the new missiles test. It is reported one of the missiles was uh, engraved with the message written in Hebrew, Yisrael Yerachal Lachalemachach Ma'ar, meaning Israel must be destroyed. That was on Euro News on March 9th of 2016. All right, now going back to the scripture on the prophecies here, it says in Micah chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, and many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. And the house of the God of God, excuse me, of the God of Jacob, and we will teach, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. It's one reason why the Pope is trying to get to Jerusalem. It's why the Pope has made the agreement with the Palestinians. Uh, it's why they want them to have a state, because the Pope will be able to reign from Jerusalem. The Pope wants to fake a millennial reign. Uh, now, watch the way Micah is wording this. And so this is why the Pope is so strong about his siding with the Palestinians. He believes he's supposed to be there so that he can rule and reign from Jerusalem and that the law of the Lord will go from there. He believes he is that Lord that should be reigning from Jerusalem. And verse 4 says, But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. In verse 5, For all the people will walk every one in the name of his God. Now that's what's written in the Masoretic. In the Septuagint, it's written, everyone, uh, in other words, uh, every, uh, the, for all the people will, will walk every one in his own way is what it is in Septuagint. Uh, the Masoretic says of his God, and he will walk in the name of the, and, excuse me, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Now, this lets you know, verse 5, whether you want to say that in the name of his God or, or in his own way, um, in his own way sounds more correct, but I will say this, they both seem to still have a truth to them. And I say that because it's, it's identifying that Micah 4, 5 is, is definitely not a millennial reign. Because in a millennial reign, there's, the people are not going to be, the, the other nations are not going to be walking in their own way on their own gods. They're not going to be there. All right? So this is speaking about prophecies being fulfilled here on the earth. All right? In verse 6, it says, In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that is halted, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. That's the, that's the returning Jews to their homeland. Okay, so let's continue on. What is in a name, the name of God? I, I, I brought this out, this across the title of the article in Haaretz, June 12, 2013, because notice Israel holds to the divine name of God, the, uh, the tetragrammaton that so many people are aware of, the, the Yahweh, yod heh vav -Hey in Hebrew. But the other nations walk every man in the name of, of his God, little g, or in his own way. In other words, they don't follow the precept that Israel does in standing for the God of Israel. Now, the, the Haaretz did an article, and I just want to bring this up for, 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 to make a point with what it says here in Micah, what is in a name? The name of God. Awareness, just part of the article, awareness of God's name is enshrined in the Ten Commandments as a primary Jewish concern. Why? Because only through identifying God by name can we be invited to a real relationship. So Israel really holds to God's divine name. But the nations, on the other hand, 
They have their own way, in other words. Now, uh, we already know. You have the Buddhist, the Zeke, the Jean, the, the, you have uh, Allah, the God of the, of the Arabs. All these are false gods. These are the little G-O-D. Or in this case here, if you're looking at the Septuagint, where every man walks in his own way, watch what uh, Reverend Graham had to say. And this is an article on CNS News, uh, March 27th of 2015, when Graham stated, uh, the title is, America has turned its back on God. Uh, when nations do this, their end is near. He states this, President Barack Obama and Attorney General Eric Holder, who are progressives, i.e. liberals, are pushing an immoral agenda on America, said Reverend Franklin Graham, who added that while this country was founded on biblical laws and principles, today America has turned its back on God, and when a nation does this, the end is near. It sets the time frame. Micah is setting the time frame. Uh, uh, like it says in the Septuagint, every man walking in his own way. Okay, now, let's go to Micah 4, 8. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, I put on there, something is missing. And it's, it's what's interesting is in the Septuagint, which is because both verses are the same, but in the Septuagint, you see something there that you, it's, it's really there also in the Masoretic text, but it's, it's far clearer in the Septuagint. In the, in the Masoretic, it says, And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. But it doesn't identify who the tower of the flock is. The Septuagint, however, though, watch what it says. And thou, dark tower of the flock. That's letting us know that that tower of the flock is an evil, evil uh, tower, okay? Daughter of, uh, see, and thou dark tower of the flock, daughter of Sion, on thee the dominion shall come and enter in, even the first kingdom from Babylon to the daughter of Jerusalem. It is clearly identifying for us in the Septuagint, it's far clearer that it is the, that, that the daughter, see, a daughter of Zion, and it says, and thou dark tower of the flock, daughter of Zion, on thee the dominion shall come and enter in. In other words, there's going to be a daughter of Zion that's going to get to reign in Jerusalem. But it says, even the first kingdom from Babylon to the daughter of Jerusalem. They're going to reign a dark tower of the daughter of Zion, in other words, someone that was spurned out from the Jewish people, which the Catholic Church was born from the Jewish people in early Christianity. Now, we do know there was a divide in there because not all the Christians agreed with one another. The Catholic Church was born in great opposition to the true believers of Yeshua that would not go along with Constantine and his Mithras ways. So there was a division in there. And then they were, they were putting to death all those who didn't agree with them, both Jews and, and Jewish believers alike at the time. And that divide came in there. But now in the day that we're living in here, it's speaking of the day that is coming. And it calls it that there would be a dark tower of the flock. And it would be a, one of the daughters of Zion. In other words, it's one of the, it's one of the you know, a descendant from Israel. All right. Of thee, the dominion shall come and enter in even the first kingdom from Babylon. Remember what the book of Revelation said? Mystery Babylon, all right, to the daughter of Jerusalem. And what is it? It's the Catholic Church ruling and reigning over the affairs of the Jewish people, and they are a dark tower of the flock. And it shows that they're in, entrenched into Babylonianism, which they we know that that to be true. Now, Look at this. The Septuagint in Micah chapter 4, verse 8 says, And thou, dark tower of the flock, daughter of Zion, on thee the dominion shall come and enter in, even the first kingdom from Babylon to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now look at that in line with Daniel eleven fourteen, 14. 
And those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fall. Now the angel is speaking to Daniel. All right, robbers of thy people, your people in other words. So they're Jews. And I translated this myself literally in, from the Hebrew. It's, it literally means not instead of robbers, it should, it should actually say also the sons of the lawless of your people shall, uh, shall exalt themselves to establish a vision that actually should say marry the vision. But they'll fall. And that's exactly, look at here in the picture, Shimon Perez, one of the lawless of Israel. He comes up there with the dark tower. The dark tower of what? A daughter of Zion. Why? Because Christianity was born from Judaism. And so they are a daughter of Israel. And a, but they've become, they're, they're, they're born out of Babylon, though. They, they took and mixed their faith in with Babylonianism. Now, I'm not talking about all Christians. There's many true Christians that love the Lord. Nothing to do with that. We're talking about the system here. And they have taken and they've married in with Rome. And now they're trying, and of course, the, the sons of the lawless, like Shimon Perez and others in the political arena in Israel, have tried to marry the vision. What does it mean by marry the vision? Now, they put in there establish a vision, but it literally in the Hebrew word is the word for marry, marry the vision. In other words, they're trying to bring to pass biblical prophecy the way they think it should come to pass. And Perez, he was, you know, according to Yitzhak Rabin's autobiography, it stated in there that he, and when he lived in Poland there, he went to a Jesuit school. Now, what good Jewish boy goes to a Jesuit school? Uh, none other than a Catholic Jesuit Jewish boy. All right, so he's trying to marry it because he believes the papacy is right. Oh my gosh, friends. Oh my God. This is, this is nuts. I mean, it's just nuts what's going on in the prophecies that are being fulfilled. It's amazing. Micah chapter 4, verse 9. This is another beautiful one. I brought this out many years or about a year or two ago. Uh, Micah says here, Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perish for pains have taken thee as a woman in travail? That's exactly right. You see, God, God is now through Micah. Because remember, he first he shows how that he's bringing them back. God in Micah shows how there's being covenants made. He's showing how that the, how that the daughter of the, of the people of Israel, uh, which were, would come from the uh, quote-unquote Christian people, the Catholic Church, would try to come in as a dark tower of Babylon, and would come in there and try, they're trying to come in there even as Daniel brings out, to marry the vision. They're trying to force their way in. So God comes to Israel and he's beginning to remind Israel of their sins and this is why it's not working. He says, Nay, why dost thou crowd aloud? Is there no king in thee? You see, Israel, we wanted a king back during the time of Samuel, but that wasn't God's way of doing things. God was running the show using a, uh, an anointed prophet, not with an anointed pope, See, Pope's not anointed. Well, he is anointed, but it's not of God. All right? But by a prophet. But they rejected Samuel, and they took, a, they took a king instead. So God asked him, is there no king in thee? And even the Septuagint is pretty much the same way there in wording here. Then he, then he asked the fatal question, is thy counselor perished? As you can see here, this is at the face of the skull right there, uh, the photograph there in Israel. I've taken these, many of these photographs there. Uh, just outside of uh, the Damascus gate there. And this is right where Yeshua is believed to have been crucified at, was on top of this hill called, at the place called Golgotha, or the place of the skull. So given its name because it has like a skull-looking face on the side of the mountain there. Okay, so he says, is there, you know, has thy counselor perished? Yes. They killed their counselor, you know. Now he says, for pains have taken thee as a woman in travail. All right, yeah, pain has taken them in travail. Why? Because look at verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail, for now shall you go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. Now, that's what's kind of interesting. The Septuagint words it a little different on that one sentence. And thou shalt reach even to Babylon. In other words, you're going to take 
I mean, it could be two different things here. They're going to dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon, where you where, that could that could have a twofold purpose there. It could be uh, where also the Septuagint says, or reach even to Babylon. They may maybe because they're trying to get uh, the, which is what always been my thought. They're they're reaching out to the Romans to get mercy because their land's being divided. But they they don't realize this isn't the, the United Nation is ran by the Vatican. So you can reach the Babylonians all you want, they're not going to rescue you. But it says, there shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Now God identifies that that Babylonian, that dark tower of the flock that comes in, that was a daughter of your people there, they're actually your enemy. Now not all believers of Yeshua are the enemy of Israel. There's many that stand for Israel, but we're talking about that Roman enemy. You might reach out there. Yeah, that's when you're going to get delivered. It'll be what God is showing you. You're going to be delivered when you're thrown out of the city. Now, that's proven fact in the op-ed right here at the top. The Vatican wants the Temple Mount taken from the Jews. This was done by Guglielmo Miotti, Israel National News, June 30th of 2015. And this is what Guglielmo, part of what he states. The Vatican PLO agreements have been signed to enable the eviction of the Jews from Jerusalem. What did, what did Micah say? You're going to go out of the city and dwell in the fields? That's right. All right. Galileo goes on to say, this follows a memorandum signed by Palestine, Palestinian and Vatican officials in 2000, which repeated the Vatican call for international mandate to preserve the proper identity and sacred character of Jerusalem. It means a return to the time when half of Israel's capital was under Islamic control. The old city was closed to Jews and the synagogues were desecrated and the walls barbed wire and snipers divided the city by force. Prophecy, friends, are, is being fulfilled. You're watching it all around you. Verse 11, Micah 4. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled and let her eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves unto the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron. Play, pay close attention. I'll put it in yellow because I want you to really watch that one there. For I will make thine horn iron. And I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. And I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Right? So Micah 4, 13, where it says, For I will make thine horn iron. When I study the word of God, this is one thing some people don't like about me. I like to search from the aspect of every document I can get my hands on. Even as I shared with you tonight thus far from the Septuagint, the Masoretic text, I look at the Syrian Codex, you know, everything you can think of, I'll look and I'll search, looking for God's truth. And I'll look for the places where they fit together. All right? So when we look at the horn of iron, it's interesting to note in the book of Enoch, in, the, in chapter 90 and verse 9, 90 and 9, and I looked until a big horn grew on one of those sheep and their eyes were opened. Wow. The sheep's eyes are open when he gets a big horn. God's going to take and turn their horn into iron and beat down their enemy. You know, friends, that pro prophecy right there has nothing to do with a military battle. A horn denotes the sounding of warning or the sounding of judgment. As we even see the horns that, that, are, that are sounding in the book of Revelation, this is your two witnesses coming up. Now, some people say, well, the book of Enoch is not of God. It's not, it's not a true Bible. Well, the book of Jude does, Jude quotes it. He was a brother of Yeshua. He quotes the book uh, pretty doggone accurately, I might add. And as well, this very book was found in the Qumran scrolls that were discovered along the Dead Sea there. Uh, and it was considered part of the biblical text or the Bible passages of their scrolls. I kind of think it was really of God. And by the way, that Qumran community is mentioned by the, uh, the, uh, the ancient church father Pliny. That was before you got into the corrupted church fathers. 
uh, back in the third and fourth century. Pliny was from the year 75. He lived during the time of the apostles and he wrote about them. Even Josephus wrote about the Qumran community there and said that they lived a, a life that was uh, above reproach even. Uh, Pliny said that, uh, spoke about this group as well. So as a godly group there on the northwest corner of the Dead Sea. That's the Qumran community. Anyway, Book of Enoch, verse 99, And I looked in, until a big horn grew on one of those sheep, and their eyes were opened. Well, we're going to look at a little bit about that in just a moment, but that 90 and 9, that verse 90 and 9 also reminded me of what Yeshua said in Matthew 18, 12. How think you if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray? Doth he not leave the 90 and 9 and goeth into the mountains and seeketh that which is gone astray? Isn't that kind of interesting? And that one sheep in verse chapter 90 and 9 and Enoch happens to be the one that... Uh, and their eyes were opened. You'll see what I'm talking about. Let's back up here to verse 4 in verse 90 and chapter 90 of the book of Enoch. And I looked until those sheep were devoured by those dogs. And by the way, just to set the stage for you a little bit, Enoch prophesies of everything that, was, that is going to happen to Israel in a story form using animals as the characters of the peoples or representations of nations, etc. In this case here, the dogs represent the German Nazis. All right, so let me just share with you. These are just my personal views on it, but let me just share with it and you'll see why I feel this way. And I looked into those sheep were devoured by those dogs and by the eagles and by the kites and they left uh, they will neither flesh nor skin nor sinew until only their bones remained and their bones fell upon the ground and the sheep became few. All right. And I looked until the time that the 23 shepherds and pasture, they completed each his time 58 times. And small lambs were born from those white sheep and they began to open their eyes to see and to, to cry to the sheep. Now I do believe that that is speaking about after the Holocaust, I believe that first verse 4 there is dealing with the Holocaust. See, they're devoured until there's no flesh on their skin, there's no sinew until their bones remained. You know, they fell into the ground and they became few. Six million Jews killed in the Holocaust, right? So anyway, verse 7, But the sheep did not cry to them and did not listen to what they said to them, but were extremely deaf and their eyes were extremely and excessively blinded. I, I think what it's speaking of here, this is the Jews after the Holocaust, their descendants, they're having children, and the ones that their eyes are beginning to open, this is the Jewish people that are beginning to recognize that, yes, Yeshua is the Messiah. And they're trying to tell their forefathers, their parents and things, but they're still deaf and blind and will not receive it and will not open their eyes. Now, looking at verse 4, let me take and share with you another thought here. Going back to verse 4 to prove to you where I believe this actually does stand for the Holocaust. And I looked until these sheep were devoured by those dogs and by the eagles and the kites, and they left them neither flesh nor skin nor sinew until only their bones remained. Remember the prophecy of Ezekiel 37 verses 1 and 2 here? Of course, there's a lot more in that prophecy. The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of bones and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley and lo, they were very dry. What is that? That was the something the Lord revealed to me a little while back. It was the Holocaust victims. And if it wasn't for the book of Enoch, I wouldn't have nothing to verify that my revelation truly come from God. But when I read this in the book of Enoch, then I knew that the Lord had revealed this to me and that it was correct. And of course, we know the story. God, he speaks to them. He tells them they can live again. They're going to live again. And they're going to stand on their feet, a mighty army. All right. Now, let's move right on ahead. And by the way, this picture here was uh, from an article called An Uncovered Mass Grave Containing the Remains of People Killed in uh, Maya Danek Camp. Uh, and I'm not sure where that camp is. I think that is actually in the Czech Republic. All right, moving on in the book of Enoch, in chapter, uh, verse 8, that is. And I saw in the vision how, how, um, how the ravens flew upon those lambs and took one of those lambs and dashed the sheep in pieces and devoured them. And I'd actually made a note about this when it says that the ravens, 
took one of the lambs and then dashed the sheep into pieces. I wonder, of course the ravens representing the Catholic Church, if that wasn't them taking up Shimon Perez and using him against his own people once Israel became a nation. That's just a conjecture. I can't say that's right. Verse 9 says, Now I looked until horns came upon those lambs, but the ravens cast their horns down. And I looked until a big horn grew on one of those sheep, and their eyes were opened. This is where it gets interesting. Now they first get their horns. That shows that Israel becomes a military power. But they're always broken up. They, they can't stay going. They're, they're torn down. It says, and I looked at them, and their eyes were opened. This is in verse 10. This is after that first, that big horn comes along. Remember what we saw in the book of Micah? He said, I'll turn your horn into iron. All right? And then we see when they get one of these sheep gets that big horn, their eyes come open. And then he says, and the sheep and the rams saw it, and they all ran to it. And beside all this, those eagles and vultures and ravens and kites were still continually tearing the sheep in pieces and flying upon them and devouring them. And the sheep were silent, but the rams lamented and cried out. Now, the United States happens to be an eagle. Of course, so was Nazi Germany. They used an eagle as well. Vultures are your Arabs. The ravens are the Vatican's and, uh, and its churches that are back in with them. And of course, Britain is actually known to be like the kites. They actually considered that to be a state bird at one time. Didn't vote it as one, but it was considered to be one. They're very prominent in that country as well. Did some research on this is where I came up with these answers. Can't say they're perfectly right, but it's my thought on it. But notice what happens, that, that while, the, while the, their eyes are coming open, they don't stop trying to rip them to pieces. All the nations, they're, they're under attack trying to tear Israel apart. And this is all along while that to your two witnesses are opening the eyes of Israel. And so, and beside all this, those eagles and vultures and ravens and kites were still continually tearing the sheep in pieces and flying upon them and devouring them. And the sheep were silent, but the rams lamented and cried out. Do you remember the prophecy of Zechariah when they look upon him whom they pierced? And I know the Jewish rabbis say, oh, it doesn't say pierce, it says thrust through. He was thrust through as well. In fact, the thrusting through is more important because his blood and his water was separated from him. And that was a sign from God Almighty to the Jews that that was the rock that was being smitten because the water was coming out of the rock that was there on Calvary. Mm. And the Bible says they, they took and they separated each one to their own family and they wept and mourned for days as a family that lost their only son. There's your lamenting and crying right there in the book of Enoch. And then people say, oh, it's not, a, not anointed of God. You know, they don't like it because of some of the things that are written in there. You know, where it talks to the fallen angels taught man to eat flesh. That's why they don't like the book. And verse 12 says, and those ravens battled and fought with it and wished to make away its horn, but they did not prevail against it. Remember what it says in Revelation about the two witnesses, they come up against them, said, and if any man try to hurt them, fire proceed from their mouth, and in this manner they must be killed. And I looked at them until the shepherds and the eagles and those vultures and kites came and cried to the ravens that they should dash the horn of that ram in pieces. Did you notice it mentioned shepherds this time? That's pastors. That's church pastors that come against the one that's got the horn, the one that's sounding out to Israel what the truth of the word of God is. And not even the church, not even the ministers like them. It ain't just the Catholic church, my brother. It's pastors. It's so-called Christians that hate the true witnesses of God. They cried to the ravens, they, they should dash the horn of that ram in pieces. See, that horn is what makes the noise. It's what sounds out the word of God, the true word of God. And they fought and battled with it, and they fought with them and cried out so that its help might come to it. See? And fought with them and cried out so that its help might come to it. 
And I looked until that man who wrote down the names of the shepherd brought them up before the Lord and the sheep and came and he helped that ram and showed it everything. Its help was coming down. You talking about a hallelujah day, as they say in the Pentecostal circles, that'll be a hallelujah day. Verse 15, and I looked into the Lord of the, uh, of the sheep came to them in anger. All those who saw him fled and they shall f and, and, and they all fell into the shadow in front of him and the eagles and vultures and ravens and kites gathered together and brought with them all the wild sheep and they all came together and helped one another in order to dash that horn of the ram in pieces. So see, the horn of the ram is not the Messiah. It's not Yeshua. Because that, the, now we see that he comes and he looked until the Lord of the sheep came to them in anger. He saw him and fled. Verse 17, Now looked at that man who wrote the book of the command of the Lord until he opened that book of the destruction that those last twelve shepherds had wrought. And he showed in front of the Lord of the sheep that they had destroyed even more than those before them had. And I looked into the Lord of the sheep, came to them, and took the staff of his anger and struck the earth. And the earth was split. And all the animals and the birds of the sky fell from those sheep and sank in the earth, and it closed over them. Little Nathan said that Mount of Olives was split. He said, but it's not an earthquake or anything like that. When Messiah comes, he's going to open up the earth. It's interesting. Kind of makes you wonder if Planet X has anything to do with that. You know, there was, a, there was a, a chapter of Scripture that I just read recently, and I want to say it was Isaiah 13. I don't recall right off. Another interesting passage of Scripture that makes you wonder about this elusive Planet X. Could it be God's final judgment? Don't know. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom. Good evening. Your prophetic segment. And by the way, friends, this is pretty much the teaching I would have done Saturday. Uh, so I don't know exactly what I will do tomorrow. So those of you that look forward to me teaching on Saturday or Shabbat, uh, Yom Shabbat in, in the Hebraic, Hebraic language, uh, this is the message I would have done then. Uh, but I'm a little bit early. It's actually already begun for us uh, as far as the Yom Shabbat, the day has begun already in Israel. Shalom and God bless you.